Welcome, welcome, welcome to the very first Tom Talks Alive. What's up, guys? Are you talking to us? Yeah. Oh, hey. Oh, oh hi. <laughs> I mean, you and the listeners. I hope everybody's equally yeah, I was, hyped. I was, I was given time for the listeners to respond, you know? I wanted, yeah. wanted to hear how they were doing. Okay, I'm we got, a little, little disappointed with that outcome, so. Yeah, Perezma <laughs> <saying it. laughs> says you look hot tonight, man, so. <laughs> well, thank you. Scratch saying you're looking uh, snazzy, beautiful face. 48 out of 55 guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it, you know, but yeah, that's right. Guys. Tom talks is live and in person for the very first time. I'm pretty pumped. I, I hope you guys are pumped. I've got ham horns queued up whenever we need them. <laughs> uh, as always, I'm your host Heath. I play titanium Mike for the podcast, Southern Tom foolery. If you don't know, uh, if you're in the stream, and we're not aware of that fact, I would advise you to check out the podcast because there could be some minor spoilers. And because honestly, you're just going to be kind of lost with, with this whole program. But yeah, if, if you want to stick around, <laughs> that will be at least a really unique way to get into the podcast, if nothing else. <laughs> uh, but, you know, to be fair, you've been warned. Uh, okay, I'm joined today, as always, by the man behind the curtain at Southern Tom Foolery, my GM in the main show, and for the majority of my TTRPG career, my co-host on Tom Hawks, Tom Hawks, <laughs> Tomahawks. That's what we should rebrand it as. Uh, my co-host on Tom Talks in the past and still the co-host for Tom Talks Alive. You know him. Hopefully you love him. It's Adam Kelly. What's up? How are y'all doing this evening? I'm very excited to be here for this. Uh, you do look pretty good, Heath, I must say. <laughs> Thank you. Are you excited to be alive? Mm, totally. Mostly. Yeah. <laughs> Most, mostly. Yeah. yeah. It's still 2020, so uh, I'm also joined by my new producer, keeping this ship flying smoothly, much like his character on the show, Felino Marana. It's Mr. Josh Computers Check Richards. <laughs> How are you doing, buddy? What's up? What's up, are Josh? You, are you excited to be alive? <laughs> A little bit. A little bit. And what about all the folks in the stream? How you guys feeling? Let us know in the chat because you can do that now. Yeah, yeah, we can we can see that now in real time. Are you excited to be alive? I feel like we're going to get some very dark answers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Josh, who we got in the stream? Oh, we man. know some of these cats, right? Looking at all of them. Uh we've got I, I don't recognize a lot of these names, but we've got uh, all the street or in Vance, it's our very own Zach uh bp tart which i'm assuming is bipolar pop tart carnifex one cosmic crit is here uh, hey, cosmic emily, crit? what's up emily hlp uh, hey. i'm gonna butcher this one but ferrison francois i think okay uh Gisapo, griffin liffin so griff's in the house uh we've got jdt twitch uh let's do this host raffle <laughs> let's go we got a whole crew <laughs> uh, in here Phrasma uh, saves Sir Newt, Steve Geddes, uh, Summerlin Steve. Creative. So I guess that's Emily. Uh, Uzmes, Veridux 17 or Veridu, I still don't know how to say it. And what do you do, Pods? Nice. Nice. Yeah, we got a good crew. We got a whole, yeah. a whole roundup. Thank you all for joining us this evening. For real, guys. I am so excited for this. I can't believe we hit the $500 Patreon goal so quickly immediately really after hitting the $400 goal and now that we're here we should probably talk about what we're doing with the new show like officially and talk about the format right yeah let's do it what so, is, what's happening where am I well well we're alive okay that's that's the starting point uh I mean Tom Talks has always been Southern Tom Foolery's sort of in-house talk show discussion show and once a month, Adam and I would get together sometimes with members of the cast to talk about topics ranging from uh, full cast wrap ups after we finish a book of an adventure path uh, to new Paizo books to sort of random philosophical discussion about any number of topics, fish included. Yeah, that, that you, you like uh, you ambushed me on that one. I wasn't ready to reveal the, the whole fish layer. And like that was Tom Talks three. You're like, hey, let's uh, let's talk about fish real quick. I was 
I was overwhelmed to talk about fish, you know? Well, the thing I is, mean, like... You can't I, get overwhelmed anytime fish comes up, Adam. Right. Well, I mean, it's just, like, I identify you so much with fish that I was like, no, nah, we're going to pull this out into the light, you know? Well, you did that. I did. I did. <laughs> and I don't apologize. Uh, so Tom Talks Alive provides the opportunity for us to carry on the spirit of Tom Talks in a new format. Um, we decided to bring Tom Talks Alive to Twitch because we wanted this show to be more interactive. We wanted that chat there. We wanted to be able to talk to you guys in real time, do listener questions in real time. Uh, we wanted it to be a more celebratory experience, more of an event every time we do it instead of, you know, passive listening. Um, and to that end, guys, are we celebrating? You guys got any drinks? I do. Yeah, you know I do. What you got? Uh, man, this is a Mountain Dew Blue Amp, I guess. But uh, it's got rum in it, so. This is why he's got the producer <laughs> <Okay>. role. <laughs> yeah, this is why oh, he wow. hasn't graduated to host yet. He's... <laughs> like, I usually drink whiskey, but, uh, you know, I felt I needed But, to, but uh, tonight, you're like, well, not whiskey. I'm going to go to Blue Mountain Dew. Pretty much. <laughs> I'm going to mix it up. I'm going to get liquor and a Baja Blast. Uh, yeah. I mean, the can says blueberry pomegranate, which sounds amazing. And honestly, it's not bad, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Well, what, what you got going on there, Adam? Uh, I'm drinking a Founders Stout that is raspberry and chocolate. It's, um, it's sweet, but it's good. Like, you know, it's not saccharin. I couldn't drink like a lot of these at one time, but one is pretty tasty, you know? Nice. Well, I can't judge uh, Josh too harshly today. It was funny. I, I did my mom's Christmas thing last night. She did it early um, so that it wouldn't conflict with other people's plans next week. And one of the random things she gave me, she gave me like it was a six pack of these like Seagram's escapes, like fruity mixed drinks. Hey, it's blue. Yeah, <laughs> it's a pina colada. Um, so I've got that on deck, but I also have, uh, I went and bought a big ass Vizzy. Hmm. I didn't a, know they came in that size. That's, that's huge. Just go to a gas station. Yeah. Uh, so something else I wanted to say though, Mountain Dew originally was made to be a mixer for whiskey. So <sighs> get off my back. And if you haven't tried it, it's actually really good. <sighs> I don't know. I don't okay. know. <laughs> I don't know if I'm prepared for that yet. Uh, so another reason we wanted to do Tom Talks Alive the way we're doing it is we wanted to get a more consistent recording schedule. We were kind of in a place where it's like, all right, well, we just got to get one out by the end of the month. And that made it hard to schedule and all that. So now uh, I know it's a little confusing tonight because we did it on <laughs> Sunday and we, we started said we were going to do them. <laughs> yeah, we, we are killing it out the gate. Uh, it will be every third Monday, but um, we switched to tonight instead of Monday, because we didn't want to conflict with uh, Super Smash Finder. Right. So I'm sure many of the people in the stream know about Super Smash Finder. Um, but if you don't, it's a project that Southern Tomfoolery is participating in. Uh, it's a fighting tournament between real play podcasts. So we're all creating parties of Pathfinder second edition characters to fight each other in a huge tournament. Um, I know Adam and I are really excited for it, and I just think it's, honestly, it's such a cool event to bring together, like, so many members of the Paizo community and the Paizo, like, podcast listening community and all those fandoms, you know, coming together for a, a shared interest. It's, I, I think it's a really interesting project and a, a beautiful thing to behold when people come together like that. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how that pans out, and I mean... I myself want to say that, you know, I want to see the first match of it. <laughs> so there's, there was a little bit of a uh, selfish reasons for rescheduling it to tonight because I'm super excited about it. And I, I want to see how that, that goes down. And as you said, our good buddies, Min Max are in the first match. So we got to make sure we're there to root for him. Right. And we just wouldn't feel right going up against that being a project that we're involved with that we support and that we're we're interested in uh you know it just felt icky to try to run something at the same time as at that. least for the first one jason i know you're out there we ain't moving it again he is <laughs> yeah. and he actually said uh, a little while ago uh, we appreciate you 
with three exclamation marks and then three hearts. So nice. Well, that's how I feel every time I hear anything about Jason. True. True. Three exclamation mar marks and three hearts. Um, so before we move on into our chosen topics for the day, I wanted to take a second and ask you guys, Adam, Josh, uh, what's been going on? Like what, what's, what you've been up to the last couple of weeks? What, what are your, your interests of the month? Oh man. Game wise or personally? Just whatever you want to talk about. I mean, I'm going to talk about cyberpunk, but yeah, I, I mean, let you guys go first. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to get super big off into, uh, or deep off into, you know, how much I've been playing cyberpunk. Cause it's been a, a pretty good bit, but, uh, I've also just 40 been doing hours. I actually only got like 25 or so, which is less than I thought. Uh, but been doing a bunch of stuff with my computer. Um, I helped build a computer today for Emily's husband. Uh, and yeah, so I, I've, I've just been doing my normal nerdy techie gearhead stuff. And also, you know, getting this whole production set up. So I love how much your life is like your character in the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, what What about you, Adam? What you been got? Yeah, uh, what you uh, been got going going on? <laughs> well, you, you're asking this question with the assumption that I have any free time to do anything. Uh, fair. I mean, I I been stuffing boxes full of candy, and when I'm not doing that, I was uh, furiously working on episode 100 and trying to get all that squared away um which we recorded and then i edited and so between that and 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 work that's basically been taking up my life uh but it it's been fun you know like a, that was a hesitant like, fun well well like i'm including work in that like you know if the busiest i get at work means that i'm just stuffing a bunch of boxes full of candy like i've had way way worse jobs than that you yeah. know yeah, I can I can empathize with that. Like the the restaurant I work at now is super chill because it's not like corporately owned. Mm -hmm. So when I, when we have new people come in and start complaining, I'm just like, you don't know how bad it can get. Like the restaurant I worked at before this was torture. Clack 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 clack. Clack 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 clack. clack, clack, clack. clack. <laughs> Producers killing it. Oh shit, um, my mic was on. <laughs> <laughs> yep. My bad, We're guys. still learning. Um, well, I've been playing a bunch of cyberpunk when I'm not at one of my basically three jobs now, um, so, which cyberpunk is super dope. That's I'm not going to say a lot about it. It's, I know it had a rough launch, but it's a very good game. I've also kind of randomly been playing a lot of Pokemon Go again because I, I you remember I had the injury to my Achilles for a good while and it finally feels uh, almost to a hundred percent so i wanted an excuse to like trick myself into walking and biking and getting some exercise mm -hmm. so i've now played uh I've, I've hit my like daily check marks on pokemon go for like 16 days in a row i've been catching a bunch of pokemons uh so yeah i'm a nerd uh, proud of you <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but it's cool like i biked around my neighborhood and just the little outskirt city I live in for like three hours the other day. It was really nice, like refreshing. Hmm. Okay, so let's start off with kind of some STF news slash the month in review. Like okay. what's, what's current with the podcast? What's been going on? Are there any announcements? Uh, anything like that, which I want to start by keeping the hype train rolling. We're going to cover the latest news and goings on in a second, but what better way to do that than to start by talking about episode 100? Oh, shit. Dude. Oh, shit. I, I, I had it written here. We are so close to our centennial episode. Spoiler alert, we have recorded episode 100. We have done you, it. You, the listeners, are so close to our centennial episode. Uh, but it, it really is. Uh, I know this is like a rite of passage that every podcast goes through when they get to episode 100, but it inevitably forces you to take a step back and think about like what a long, strange trip it's been since we started this project in April of 2019. April 2019. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, like when we started it, we of course, really 
we're like, yes, we're, you know, we had all the ambition in the world to get to episode 100 and beyond, you know, but it felt so like in the future, you know, that's like something that's, we'll get to, you know, if we're successful and stuff like that. And uh, I mean, here we are, whether, you know, pretty successful, I, I'd say, but either way, we've done a hundred episodes regardless. And, uh, you know, it's just been such a good time. Like, that's the thing. When I look back over the the 99 episodes prior to this one is that, you know, with the exception of 97 and 98, we were having a great time the whole time. And I think we were having a good time in 97, 98, but it was just tough, you know? Uh, <laughs> but, but like, I, it's, it's been, it's just been such a fun time going on this adventure and playing Starfinder. Like, I've loved the game more than I thought I would, you know, and I thought I would love it. You know, it wasn't like I was reluctant to play it. Uh, but the more that we've played it and the more stuff that's come out for it and expansions and options and stuff like that, it's just allowed us to like continue to grow this particular adventure with all sorts of new things. And, and I, I can't wait to do more. Yeah. I mean, I'm, if I if I were to just release all my feelings about it, like I would just parrot the exact same conversation. It's been such a fun journey. Starfinder is such a fun system and an intriguing setting that uh, much like you, I was like, I know I'm going to like this. Mm -hmm. like, I have no doubt in my mind I'm going to like this system when we started it. And it's it's lived up to that. And then especially with like some of the more recent books, like The Calm and, and stuff like that, uh, Near Space, the universe of Starfinder has opened up so much more and, and the game has really come into its own. And it's, it's an awesome time to be, you know, kind of to some degree on the forefront of like doing Starfinder content. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, we get to bring in each new thing as we're growing our story, you know, and that's really, that's really neat. How about you, Josh? How, how have the hundred episodes treated you? I mean, they've been good. I've, I've enjoyed all of it except for the the two in question. And even in that, I did not enjoy them. They were just really heavy, mm -hmm. you know, and, and trying to figure out what to do, how to handle that situation was just, it was just a lot. Uh, but yeah. as a whole, man, 100 episodes, it's ridiculous. I'm not going to say that I never thought we'd get here, but we did it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> hey, we did it, guys. Well, we've recorded. We did it. <laughs> yeah, we've recorded episode one hundred now. Uh, how do you, how do the two of y'all feel about it now that it, we've we've done it and you've seen what it is? Well, we're done. We can quit now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the big twist. Is episode one hundred actually wraps up the APA arc right there, right there, <laughs> yep. and there. We're gonna move on to our uh, Sonic. Uh, yeah. Uh, AP. Got to give the people so what Sonic they want. Ooh. TTRPG. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, speaking of, uh, we've, we've mentioned the, the couple of episodes recently that, that were pretty dark. Um, and, and I think I, I really enjoyed the darker episodes. Uh, I can understand people that might not, but it is a horror campaign, you know? And that's the thing. It's like we, we came into a horror campaign it, expecting something like this eventually but it still like creeps up on you but it's i i still really enjoyed it but it's the, it's the kind of enjoyment you get like when you're watching a scary movie and you get a jump scare like you're scared for a second but then you're like if it was a good movie you're like i really enjoyed that even though i was scared for half of it well i think that it's it's giving you all a different space to explore your characters with you know like to, it's just a new area to see how your characters are, you know, and, and it was hard and it was emotional. I mean, we had to stop for a minute during 98 just to catch our breaths from it, you know, and this is, this is not something that I would recommend doing like for every session, you know, like, but from time to time, especially in a horror campaign, it's, it's something that, we need to explore and, and realize just how bad the situation is for the APA, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that 
many of us in the podcast are like like identify as horror people horror mm-hmm. buffs you know i certainly don't and like i I've, I've enjoyed it despite myself i figured i was probably the person that would have arguably the toughest time with it um but i've still enjoyed it the only critique i have and it's probably like my own head more than the genre itself but i, I think the thing that i i keep coming back to with horror that makes it not my favorite is that I feel like it can be kind of limiting. Like it it provides you a new set of stimuli to respond to in ways that you wouldn't normally, but I just find the the genre sometimes can be limiting because of the, the ways that it forces you to respond to things. Right. Right. So let's talk for a second since we're on the topic about how freaking grim dark we've become here at Southern Tom foolery. Right. Uh, I think we were initially pretty amused at that assertion that that we fit a grim dark label, but as Adam's already said, uh, maybe we did stray into that territory a little bit. So, I mean, Adam, you in particular, how do you feel about the podcast new grim dark vibe? And, vibe, and do you do you really think we fit the bill? I mean, there are certainly grim dark elements to it. You know, I, I, there always have been. The flashbacks have been kind of tragic and and traumatic, you know. And so I, I get it. But I mean, at the same time, we're also like a bunch of friends joking all the time, and we have characters like Bright Bright Flickerdim, you know, Bright Bright Crackle Flickerdim, and we have Murglebur. And you don't know, you like, dare forget Bright Bright's middle name. I, you know. We are doing a horror adventure right now, so there it's there's definitely going to be some exposure to some more dark and like heavier content. But as I said, ninety seven and ninety eight was a moment that had to happen, but it's not something that any of us want to like rest in for a long time. You know, we're we're gonna play the game the way we like to play. And we like to have those moments, but we also like to have fun, you know? And so Southern Tom Foolery at its core is still about the six of us having fun with each other, you know? And so I feel like Grimdark is a little bit of a misnomer, but I get it. And particularly with the, like where we're at right now, if you're caught up, yeah, it's hard to say that we aren't Grimdark because, you know, the last two weeks have been pretty shitty for our players, you know, with very little <laughs> hope. Um, but that being said, I don't want to give too much spoilers away. I, I just will say that we have a way we like to play the game and we certainly get back to that when we need to, you know, so look forward to some less heavy darkness coming up in the, in the next couple of weeks, you know? So what you're saying is we need to look forward to meeting bright, bright, crackle, flicker, grim, flicker, grim. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> or dark, dark, crackle, flicker, grim. There you Something go. Like, there it yeah, is. it'd have yeah. to be dark, dark, right? Yeah. <laughs> um. Anyways, um. So, uh, kind of moving on. Uh, I've said it a bunch of times in the past, but guys, I am really excited that we're finally going to get to spend some time on an actual packed world's planet, Verses. Yeah. So now, you know, we'll we'll get into some Verses lore in a little bit, but just in a general sense, are you guys pumped to get some time planet side and on Verses, like in particular? I know Josh obviously would have an interest in this location, considering his character is a Verthani. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm just a producer. I don't I don't really know, but <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'm I'm definitely looking forward to to getting to explore it uh, and like night city man like i'm already in the headspace because of cyberpunk you right know? right and going to that type of place with my character being from there and all the awesome stuff that's going to play out because of that i'm really looking forward to it yeah i mean i can't get away from the, the more i read about um verses and some of the cities there like i keep doing the same thing like this is like prime night city territory that's like a whole I mean, planet ver- yeah versus is like all about you know augmentations and and cybernetic stuff mm-hmm. like that's a big part of their industry yeah so like their primary industry is augmentations you know yeah i mean i i'm just i'm excited to go to any planet but versus in particular is is really interesting 
and and very modern too. I know. I've been telling Josh since we picked up the Starfinder core rulebook, dude, just wait until Signal of Screams and we're going to go to like Cyberpunk. Well, I didn't tell him we were going to Cyberpunk Planet, but like that it was going to just wait. You know, book two is going to be all the Cyberpunk. And I'm so I'm excited to finally get there. I mean, we've been talking about that. I've been hyping that up to Josh for a while now. So I am, uh, I'm glad that we're there. Um, there's some fun stuff coming up as the crew explores Versys, so can't wait for y'all to, to to hear it. But, you know, we still got a lot to go, don't we, Heath? Yeah, yeah. Well, and like I said, we're going to get into some other Versite lore um, mm-hmm. in the back half. So uh, before we move on to our main attraction, um, I wanted to take a second to talk a little bit about the adventures of Weldy, DJ Trev, Doc- Dr. Loxius, Sweet Heat, and Captain Fritz. I'm talking about hacky sack heroes yeah that's such a fun game <laughs> it is it's, it's fun and lighthearted, and it's such a great counter to signal screams yeah we've never needed that game more than we need it right now you know right well i mean i've got to say I, i'm really proud of emily for the work that she's put in and for how fun she's made the adventures of hacky sack heroes mm-hmm. and i mean she's doing it all homebrew like that is just wild to me like i've you know, I'm not a big homebrew guy to begin with. I've pretty much only played adventure paths or, or modules and stuff like that. And the concept of like writing homebrew adventures is like really daunting, like mm-hmm. you know, almost terrifying to me. Although I've started to come around to the idea lately. I had a couple of ideas for like one shots when I was reading the packed worlds and I was like, maybe, maybe I could do this. Maybe I could try my hand at it. <laughs> yeah. Even though I'm horrible at all the numbers and balancing. Uh, she, she is doing a great job and, you know, um, she took up that mantle like a champ, (laughs) uh, and, and the, the adventures that we've gone on have been so much fun and I can't wait to see where we're going next, you know, uh, as we just wrapped up a, a little mini arc or whatever. And, you know, Emily, I know you're out there watching just thank you for for a good time yeah you're you're killing it man for real and i can't wait to see what else we got coming up because i mean we're starting to get into like the fun levels of our characters we're third level now and you know we're starting to get into our kit a little bit right and i mean it's been really fun anyways despite you know i mean when you've played as much as we have those first two levels can kind of feel like all right we just got to knock this out to get to where we want to go But she's done a really good job of making it really entertaining and letting us goof off and and entertain ourselves, even in those low levels. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I I can't wait to get in uh, some deeper levels and and really see what our characters can do and see where she takes us after this. What what do we call it? The Aetherite arc? Is that what Mm -hmm. we're calling it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So what I mean. Do you want to get into, I mean, how you feel about that arc in particular? I, I loved it. You know, it introduced some some real tension, you know, from, and, you know, a little bit of spoilers here. Again, try to keep it general, but you're, you're, you're listening to Tom Talks and we're talking STF news. So uh, the general thing is that we find the substance and in, in from that moment when we find it to the end of, of it with the lab there was lots of cool fights and like exploration and lore that she created for us you know and as i saw um in the chat earlier i think it was giuseppe who said it but yeah the the trophy room of zickel that has become zickel i just can't wait to keep stacking him with a bunch of absurd trinkets as we continue to go you know yeah that poor guy's gonna be so tacky by the end of this thing yeah yeah he is. it's just ridiculous um but yeah i mean like i i again i'm really impressed with how well emily's done with hacky sight heroes it's it's really inspiring honestly like it like i said it makes me feel like i could do this you know and it makes me want to to maybe try my hand at homebrew at some point you know and and part of that appeal is like you get to throw whatever monsters in there you want go find the funnest things you can you know the things that interest you and put it in your in your world yep 
Well, Emily, we can't wait to see what's next. <laughs> okay, so on to the main event of the evening. Um, so Adam and I have both built uh, one, each built one of the new uh, playtest classes, a precog and a nano site. And Josh is going to do this, uh, do us the favor of running a monster for us to fight and try out these uh, playtest characters live and in person. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Uh, I, maybe before we get into the fight, we just talk a little bit about our builds and, and what you thought about the class. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I still haven't spent as much time as I would like to going over it all, but I did. I, I have a lot the last couple of days, um, which I guess I'll start. I built a precog, uh, a Yosoki precog, who I named Coggins <laughs> uh, because it was cute. Uh, so precogs they're casters with their primary stat being dex yeah which is that caused that, no uproar on the internet at yeah all. it wasn't even mildly controversial mm -mm. <laughs> um which i i can't help but agree with those for whom it was controversial because like i am known for hating dex as a stat for it like just because it's overpowered in every single ttrpg so to have a dex caster that he can just double up on the skills he needs for everything and then have that also be his casting modifier seems a little ridiculous to me and <laughs> i think it's possible that they end up going back to wisdom with this one yeah because that's what everybody thought everybody thought it was going to be a wisdom caster well yeah i mean you think precog that's you know you think it's intuition right like right. And, and for them it's uh, with dexterity it's been described as being so nimble with the actual fabric of time <laughs> that your yeah, hand moves. but like what does that even mean yeah i don't know i don't know right so uh, the way that precogs work uh, obviously dex is their casting stat or whatever but as far as their specs if you want to call them that every precog gets to pick an anchor um and that is like an event or a process of thought or time or, or something like that um that usually in a lot of them it's like an event that was so traumatic that that is it has disrupted their fate or their timeline hmm. and that's why they got magic powers and and eventually it will be corrected you know somebody will come from the future and fix their timeline so the anchor that i picked is called doomed future okay <laughs> and i'll just give you the straight up description it says, you are cursed with visions of a terrible future, whether it's the distant awakening of a great old one, a post-apocalyptic realm where automatons have conquered the stars, or a future where the swarm encompasses all known worlds. A seemingly inevitable future is inseparably linked with your consciousness. Though you can see only glimpses of this doomed future, you struggle to avoid it, hoping your actions will eventually change the terrifying visions that you receive. So real lighthearted yeah, that yeah. I went into. Um, so like I said, anchors are your specs, but then kind of the key feature with a, a precog that makes it a precog are called paradoxes. And paradoxes are really interesting because they, they tie into the notion of like manipulating time and stuff. So you get an amount of uh, paradoxes equal to one plus half your dex modifier and you get them at the beginning of every day and when you wake up and do your daily preparations and get your paradoxes what you do is like for, for instance i have three paradoxes on the character i made as soon as you wake up and, and your character does his preparations you roll three d20s and you note down those rolls that you got mm -hmm. and you just tuck them away to the side and long story short you can sub those roles in for lots of other different things. And that's what makes a precog a precog is that you can take pre-rolled die and sub them in for something you don't want to risk messing up. Or that okay, you want to buff so, or something like that. Right. So it feels a little oracle-y to me, right? But like it's I, I like the, I do really like that mechanic of it. You know, yeah, it's, like that it's feels very unique to its class. Yeah. I I, I 
going into this, I didn't actually know what to expect from the precog. I was like, oh, it's just going to be like a, a variant of a mystic, you know? So in the chat, we've got Steve Geddes saying, presumably they were going with the, you know what's about to happen and start acting early, so you have high decks. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also follows up saying, trouble is the causality feels backwards when you play it. You know, I gave myself high dexterity so I could be a precog. Mm -hmm. So. Right, right. Okay, I can totally see that. Um, yeah, I, I just think it, <laughs> I think their explanation of it was less important to them than getting across this paradox system. I think that's what the creators were really jazzed about was the paradox system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I can see why. I think it's very cool. Um, but it, it's also a very, in terms of like Magic the Gathering, it feels very blue, you know, like you're, you're putting something to the side to wait to sub in at right the moment or at the right moment and like reverse something or, you know, change something um it's it's very like it requires you to really pay attention to what's happening at every moment in a combat in particular mm -hmm. um which is not a bad thing i think it's very cool um which i'm not going to go over i've got five different things that i can use my paradox for on this character but i'll just let some of those come out in the combat okay so so what about the uh nanosite yeah, so the nanosites are really cool concept for a class, and I, I will say that my concern when they first announced it that it was going to overlap with the Technomancer a lot, just because the Technomancer has a lot of spells that are flavored with nanobots. But I think that there's a difference between having like magical control over some nanobots and being like made up of nanites. You know that your that your whole being is kind of infused with nanites, and. Uh, so to that end, what they've done is make it, it really does feel like a constitution class, which is what it is. And um, you have nanite surges, which is kind of your main resource that you use to activate a lot of your features. And one of the, you know, the main thing you're going to be using that for is your nanite array, which you don't actually have to use a surge to activate an array. Uh, but you can make them pe more powerful with using surges and resolves and all that. Uh, but you have sheath array, uh, cloud array, and a gear array. And each one of those different arrangements do different things for you, where sheath kind of gives you some protection and stealth abilities. Cloud does some really cool, like, I don't know, almost meta magic type stuff. It, it but there's no magic here. I, I say that just because it extends your reach and your abilities by having this cloud that kind of goes around you and comes out of you. And it has a lot of control functions to it that I really like. And that's actually what I'm, what I'm going to highlight tonight is the cloud array of the three. Now you can go, and I think you're intended to go through all three of these based on the situation at hand, but I just wanted to kind of spotlight the cloud array because I think it's really cool. And then their subclass or their, you know, their specialization is called their faculty. And I went with redirection. Um, and so for, for this, the nanites, they, it's all about being able to move energy, you know, by redirecting attacks or moving objects or lend weapons, some devastating mass that's directly from the play test there described as forceful and energetic. So I thought it'd be fun to mess around with that. And it has some really cool abilities that, uh, again, I'll use in the combat here. And it just has all these things that, it, it seems really versatile, you know, like to where you can, you can kind of respond to almost any situation, you know? Um, nice. And, and it's just this morphous cloud that's like constantly assessing you know, what's happening in the current situation and adapting to it. And I really, I really like that about it. Uh, and mine is named uh, Nani. So we got really creative with our, with our names here. <laughs> Coggins and Nani. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody in there before I could make the joke said uh, Lenny Coggins. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, good job. You're teaching them, you're teaching them well. Oh, that was just Oppo. So proud of you. Well, it makes sense too. 
Uh, all right. Well, Josh, do you want to put put our these are level seven versions of these classes that we made? What are we what are we fighting against here? All right, you're going to be fighting against a tenebrous worm. Well, I know what that is. Yeah, because uh, you tried to kill us with one uh, not not super long ago. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, just uh, forewarning, this is the first time ever that I have done anything even adjacent to GMing anything, running a monster, <laughs> hey, well, that's any type of anything. So uh, uh, so yeah. What better, what better my place premiere. to do it here? You know, <laughs> what better place to do it than in front of an audience? Yeah, <laughs> right, uh, right. You won't seize up at all, I promise. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm gonna just roll with it, man. It might, it's gonna be loosey goosey. Should be fun yeah. though. Uh, I will say that this map is under dim light, uh, which you'll be able to use to your advantage with the with the worm. Um, so let's see what you can throw at us. All right, well, uh, let's roll initiative. Ooh, I like it. All right. Uh, that is weird to hear coming from you. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't understand. <laughs> What? Uh, come on now. Do, 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 do. Sorry, folks. Uh, we are at the mercy of roll 20 at this point. Uh-oh. <clears throat> well, I rolled a 19. You rolled a 19. All right, let's see here. I rolled a 23. Natural 20. Start Natural out 20, yes. And I rolled a 13. So we're going to go with that. So, uh, yeah, Nani, you're up. Okay, well, uh, Nani, the first thing they are going to do is for a move action, activate their nanite array into a cloud array, uh, which is going to basically allow me to put this cloud out in front of me. And so I'll read, I'll read it here for you folks at home. Uh, my nanites will spread out into a faintly visible cloud that fills up to a number of contiguous five foot squares. Uh, one must be adjacent to me equal to one plus the constitution bonus. So that's going to be six squares. Now, because I'm a level seven, that gets more powerful. So I actually get 10 contiguous squares. And just to make it easy, we'll say that it's going to be the nine blocks. Uh, here, I'll do a little drawing here. Are you, are you saying contiguous squares? Yes. Well, that's not what I'm okay. saying, but that's what I should be okay, saying. Yeah. That's what he, yeah, that's what he means. Yeah. All right. So those, those there's my cloud right there. Um, and then I'm going to move into the cloud, downgrade my standard action and move directly into the cloud. And that is gonna give me some concealment, 20% actually. And uh, Coggins, that would give you concealment too if you're in the cloud. Hmm, I don't will like I, it. Will I be able to see in the cloud? Uh, let's see, I believe so, yes, but let me make sure. Now, what about if the worm goes in there? Will he get concealment as well? Or it, rather? Uh, yeah, it would. Okay. <laughs> so this is just going to be a clusterfuck <laughs> at the gate. Uh, all right. So, but that will be my turn. Okay. So you started out hot with a nat 20 on initiative, and I started out by forgetting what my class is based on. I've got to roll my 3d20s. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Set aside, yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And I don't have any real dice with me. So, first D20 is a 10. Okay. Second D20 is a 13. Third D20 is an 11. All kind of middling. Yeah, that's not great. Mm -hmm. Not great precog rolls there. Yep, that is correct. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, what is the range on this? It, just, it says close range. Is that does that mean touch? 
Uh, that's going to be uh, close range is 25 feet plus five feet for every level. Oh, well, perfect. I'm 25 feet away. <laughs> um, well, but so I'm on the other side of the, the, your cloud that you made. Can I see through that corner of the cloud or do I need to move to, to, be, to have line of sight on the worm? Uh, I mean, I know I'm GMing this, but I don't know how that ability works. So oh, I'm know. asking Adam. What, what are you asking me? <laughs> do I, am I, can I see through the cloud that you've made currently? Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, I will say that thank you to JDT Twitch for the correction. It only grants concealment if you spend a nanite surge, which I will. will and it So it's I'm down a surge to do that. Um, but it's 20% concealment. But it's, that doesn't make it like affect your line of sight. Okay. All right. So then I believe from where I'm at, I can just cast the spell I have. I'm going to cast a third level spell that is the coolest thing at all about <laughs> this class, the Precog, and it's called Death's Door. Oh, boy. And so it, it has different effects for what level you cast it at. I only took it at the highest level I could. So it says you accelerate a living opponent's personal timeline to the end of their natural life cycle, <laughs> unleashing the ravages of time in a devastating surge. The target can attempt a fortitude saving throw to have the damage and ignore the ability damage dealt by the spell. Spoiler alert, it does ability damage in Starfinder. Um, so at third level, it deals 4d10 damage plus 4 strength and 2 dexterity damage Good to the Lord. Target. Goodness yeah. gracious. <laughs> All right. So what do I need to roll for him? Uh, a fortitude save. Oh, Okie dokie. You're going to want to pass that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I probably did with a 29. 29 will get it, yeah. Oh, wow, okay. So then you will take half of the damage and you won't take any of the ability damage, okay? So, um, yeah, I'll roll my 4d10 and you'll take half. We'll get there. Okay, Ooh. that is 22. So you'll take 11 damage. You're muted if you're talking. The worm does not like it. Is that the end of your turn, though? Um, you got anything else? Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, well. Uh, I was really hoping I'd get that ability damage on you. Mm -hmm. This worm is hungry for flesh, and it's going to be going for the thing that's closest to him. Okay. Um, which is right in front of him. So move south one, uh, one square and is going to go for a bite on Nani. Okay. Is it Nani or Nanny? Nani. Okay. Nanny. Nanny. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see. What are my bonuses? There we go. So let me get a D20 roll for that bite. It's going to be a... I'm bad at math. Uh, 30? 30 will, will get me. Okay. So that's going to be a damage roll. So that's going to be 14 damage as well as uh, I believe when we were talking about this beforehand, Adam, you said something about a poison every time I attack. Yeah. So, well, it has that shadow acid. So every time oh, you yeah. successfully bite, uh, you get to do another three D six points of damage. Oh, uh, but man, that sucks. you're really. going to need to roll some concealment. Okay. Fair, 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 fair. So we roll a D100. Oh, I love to see it. Three ones yeah. on that 3D6. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Thanks, roll 20. Uh, so let's this see. This is why we roll real dice. Yeah. <laughs> so a uh, D100, what is it? A 80 and above? Or sorry, 21, 21 or better. is a success. 21 or better is a success, yeah. Okay. Uh, so that succeeds. So you end up taking a total of... Let's see. 13, no, no, 
14 plus 3, so 17 damage. All right, what I'm going to use is actually use one of my nanosite abilities called Defensive Dispersal. And I am, uh, as a reaction, whenever I take damage, I can protect myself with my nanites as they create a temporary barrier or even cause part of my body to temporarily disperse. So just kind of phases out as tries to bite there. So I reduce that damage dealt by the triggering effect by an amount equal to the nanocyte level plus constitution modifier, and I gain a plus one circumstance bonus to the first saving throw against any effect that comes with it. So I'm going to reduce that by seven plus five. That's going to be 12 damage reduced. Cool, 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 cool. cool. So you so take how much two. was that? How much? You take two damage. Two damage. <laughs> Beautiful. Great. I like it. Awesome. Uh, welcome, welcome to my life here. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> okay. Um, back to me, yeah? Yeah. And let's see, Nani is up. All right. So Nani is going to use their sword. Uh, so I got an actual sword. I'm not using the gear array here. I'm just using, using the sword. And uh, as a move action, I'm going to designate a target within 60 feet for my seeking strike that they have to be inside my cloud, which you are. Uh, and it will make the nanites focus on this target, momentarily enhancing my accuracy against the target, giving me a plus one bonus to the attack roll and ignoring any target's concealment. Okay, so I see how that works. You put yourself in concealment, baddies come into concealment, and then, oh, hey, guess what? I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's That's pretty cool. Pretty neat. That's pretty neat. Okay. All right, so I'm going to swing here with my centered longsword. I'm going to get a plus one to this roll. And that is going to be a 27 to hit. Uh, so yeah, that hits. And for those watching at the screen, uh, for whatever reason, roll 20 kind of spazzes out when it comes to attack rolls on, uh, on the Starfinder sheet. That's just why there's like a thousand dice on screen. So mm -hmm. you can ignore those. Just check the, the damage, like the actual rolls in the chat over your one point in the mouse right now. Uh, I love seeing the, the dice puke that. Oh, yeah. Same. yeah. Total, total of dice. Dice puke. So you said it was 25 damage? Uh, 24 damage. 24 damage. Okay. So, uh, That's yeah. slashing damage. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to take that 24, but you're also going to have to do a, I believe it's a reflex, reflex save. save. Yeah. Against those spikes, huh? Uh -huh. All yeah. Right. To, uh, go to swing your sword, your arm brushes up against it, but not well enough because you pass that save with a 26. Handily yeah 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 all right awesome awesome all right well that's my turn coggins what you got so the the worm is concealed from me yes but only 20 percent. oh okay it's only 20%. yeah i mean you can see where he is it's uh you know similar to being like in a, in a smoke grenade or something it doesn't keep you from actually seeing them right, it just gives right. them you know concealment for attacks and whatnot okay so um, I already realized I messed up something last turn. <laughs> so uh, I am going to, I've got two level three spell slots and I'm going to use my, my second death's door. All right. Okay. All right, so, so I'm going to get that fortitude save out there for you. Yep. Uh, it's going to be a 22 on the fortitude save. Okay, that'll save. So that saves. I'm kind of glad it saved because now I get to redeem myself a little bit. So I want to spend one of my paradoxes to use spell rewind. Ooh. So, so because the opponent I was targeting, it has to be a single opponent, uh, saved his, his, on his fortitude save, I can use one of my paradoxes as long as it's at least twice the level of the spell level used to uh, I rewind the spell and put put that spell slot back in. So nice. that's cool. I didn't waste my 
my last level three spell slot. I get it back because a little failed. bit of that, uh, that blue magic bullshit. Well, yeah. and it, what's cool about it is it makes that 10, 11 and 13 that you rolled. Not so shitty. Cause like a 10 is plenty to cover that. So you can, well, I'm going to use my 11. Okay. All right. Um, so you'll, I'll, I still will roll 40, 10 damage and you'll take half. Okay. Just want to give a shout out right. to Steve Geddes. He's uh, heading out. Says, uh, need to go back to work later all. Thanks for the stream, STF. So thank yep. you for joining us. Yep. So glad to have you. Yeah, Steve's the man. Um, okay, so that's 26 damage. So you'll take half. So 13. Okie dokie. So I that's can, 13 uh, damage I did without needing a, without even using a spell slot. That's really, really neat. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like it for my uh, for my worm, but I like oh, it. Oh, I bet. <laughs> uh, and so, if I could count the number of times that I've heard Josh say, "I don't like it for my worm," <laughs> <laughs> you would be counting to one. What? To one, maybe two now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, the it's the the worm's turn again, and he's going to rear back and hiss at Nani and trying to latch in again with a bite attack. Okay, come at me. Uh, we didn't roll concealment on that spell. Well, well it's it. it wouldn't, well, it's a spell. It wouldn't be a, an attack. Yeah, it's an area right? of effect. He rolled a save, so it yeah, doesn't, yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know. I never play casters. Oh no, uh, that's going to be a nineteen to hit. That is going to miss. Oh wait, no. Hang on. Like I said, I'm bad at math. Five plus seventeen. It's not 19, it's 22. 22. Does that still miss? Uh, no, it doesn't, but I do need you to roll that concealment. Okay. Uh, pass the concealment. All right, come on. So it's going to be 1d8 plus 3d6. All right, so that is 15 plus 11, 26 damage you're going to take. Oof. Uh, so I'm going to do that surge again and reduce that by 12. I'm down to seven surges out of 10 now. Uh, so what was the total? Uh, God, man, you know, my memory is terrible. Uh, 11 plus it's 15 plus 11. So 26. All right. So minus 12, that's going to be 14. Still doing okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's Nani's turn. I'm going to do the same thing, I think, with the Seeking Strike. And let's see here. Yeah, I'm going to do that Seeking Strike as move action and then attack. And that will be, come on now. It's taking forever to come through here. Yeah, just uh, waiting on the roll from roll 20. There we go. There we go. Ooh, that's a 13. That's probably going to miss. Uh, yeah, 13 absolutely misses. All right. Uh, well, that's my turn. Even though it's a miss, anytime you attack me, you got to roll for those bristles. Give me a reflex uh, save. Yeah. Okay. Oh no. All right. All right. I'll roll. Twenty-two. Okay, you pass. All right. All right. Time. All right. Uh, it's end of your turn. Yep. Okay. Coggins, what you got? All righty. So, I think for right now. Coggins is going to cast mirror image on himself. Okay. Uh, explain that to me. What does it do? All right. So it creates a number of illusory that inhabit your square. These doubles make it difficult for enemies to precisely locate. And when you cast mirror image, it creates 1d4 figment images. These images remain in your space and move with you, mimicking your movements, sounds, and actions exactly. 
whenever you are attacked or are the target of a spell that requires an attack roll, there's a possibility the attack targets one of your images instead. If the attack hits, roll randomly to see whether the selected target is real or a figment. If it's a figment, the figment is destroyed. If the attack misses by five or less, one of your figments is destroyed by the near miss and an attack that misses you due to a mischance also destroys an image. Okay. That's, that's, that's kind of cool. There's, there's like the... literally two more paragraphs of description on this one spell. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but no, that's, that's a... that's a pretty cool thing. Like, uh, how, what was it? There's a character in, uh, in the game Apex Legends that has that as one of their abilities to be able to like have holographic decoys basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That follow you, you know, run along with you, follow your movements and, and everything to hopefully, uh, not have the actual player get shot. So that's right. cool. So we'll I, did, represented here. I did that because I want to make this fight interesting. And so that's my standard action. And then as my movement action, I'm going to move right up on the, uh, the worm. And okay. uh, as part of my move action, I will draw my gun. Cool. Cool. Well, uh, seeing new flesh and not having great success with the, uh, with Nani. The worm's going to slither around and try to go for a bite on Coggins. Okay. So that is going to be, oh, that's a natural, that's a natural 20, 20 on it. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. It's a natural let's 20. Just, let's just call it confirmed and you get the roll damage twice. Yeah, just go ahead and take yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So there's the two damage dice. Uh, not much extra except for the bonus. Uh, so that's going to be plus six, 28 damage total, plus another 3d8. Oh my God. That, uh, yeah. Yeah. You got to roll for that mirror image though. Oh yeah. yeah I do. That's what, I that's do, what I'm hoping for. All right. So what do I need to roll for the mirror image again? Uh, roll. So there's, uh, did you roll oh, we, didn't, we didn't roll yeah we didn't roll how many i have here i'll no, do that so, real quick it's one okay. d4 okay so i got two images so there so, are three targets yeah right. so roll a d one is one is a hit two is a miss three is a miss okay let's do it that way yeah sounds good so uh i'm gonna do a, a single d6 so one and two is a hit two three four five it hits one of the decoys Hits one of the decoys. Nice. Okay, nice. cool. So just poof. so it, it lunges around and chomps at one of these. Uh, what are they? Holographic? Or are they like doubles? I mean, like they're they're, they're, uh, they're illusion magic. Illusion. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah, just just lunges into and through one of the the uh, illusory coggins. Yep. Little, little mouse man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, that is the tenebrous worm's turn. Let's see, uh, Nani, you are up. I think uh, Nani is going to full attack. Okay. And just and just get after it. Um. So I will do that with my sword. Come on. Let's, let's make this good. Look at all those dice, everybody. Yeah. All right. That's a twenty-four and an eighteen. And that is factoring in the minus four from the full attack. The first attack hits. Second one misses. Second one is a miss. All right. That's going to get you for 12. Okay. Uh, I will take that, but go ahead and give me that roll for. I will, I will use. Uh, I got to roll concealment. Didn't you do the thing to make it to where you don't have to? I think that that is. Requires a move action to do. Is that once per turn or is that a, like a, it stays up for a certain amount of time? Yeah, it's once, it's like just for the next attack. Okay. Well, yeah, go ahead and give me that uh, concealment check then. And, you know, I think that maybe we don't have to take this all the way to the end here because I think there's a lot of HP left, but let's see. Yeah, it's that about a, half. That's a hit, so that will get you for 12. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, the worm is sitting at about half uh, half of its health. Uh, I'd say let's let's do another one or two rounds. See if you guys have anything else uh, to All throw right. out to showcase. 
Uh, so it is now Coggin's turn. Okay. So Coggins is, uh, I'm going to use, I remember I got that spell slot back. I'm going to use that spell slot again for death's door. And I know I'm going to take an attack of opportunity for it. Definitely. Okay. So come on, roll 20. Or don't. <laughs> All right, so okay. you got to roll. So forti fortitude save. Yep. Uh, let me do that opportunity attack and resolve that, and then I'll get to your... Yeah, because he might negate the spell here. Uh, see, that is a 12 on the die for a 29 to hit. Oh, damn. Okay, 29 will hit, uh, but I am going to use one of my paradoxes Okay. Uh, to use prescient casting. As part of casting a spell, you can use a paradox to not lose your spell if you take damage from an attack against you, including an attack, attack of opportunity. Dope. So I'm going to get my spell back again. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you still take damage from it or? Yes. Okay. Yes, I do. Whoops. I did not mean to roll that die. Well, that's uh, all you get to do is eight damage. Uh, I mean, I'll take it considering it's a D8. <laughs> oh. Let's, see, no, let's get that D8 up there. That's seven. 7 plus 11. That's going to be 18. And give me a reflex save, buddy. Uh, yeah. Reflex save. Okay. Mm -hmm. For that acid. Oh, actually, no. I'm sorry. It's not a ref not a reflex. It was attacking you. It's the acid. I just do another 3D6. Yeah, just another 3D6. Oof. Okay, just give me my total when you figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. It's going to be 18, bro. Yeah. Well, 18 plus 11. So... 29. Ouch. Yeah. Oof. All right. All right. So let's get that death's door worked out. Well, I need to give you a. No, you interrupted it. You hit you, it. Yeah, you canceled oh. it. He just doesn't lose the slot. Oh, wait. Oh. No, no. With the attack of opportunity, you got to roll to see if you hit one of my fucking. My oh, other. I still have one that's more true. mirror. That's in true. It. So I need to basically flip a coin to see if I hit you. Yeah. All right. A. I'm going to roll a D4. A one and two hits you. Three and four hits the decoy. So Got it hits him. you, buddy. Got okay, him. cool. That, I, that's honestly better because I don't want to have to go back and fix stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I yeah, guess. That's uh, big damage. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a lot. So it's I not... used Death's Door, but I didn't use my movement action. So I'm going to guard and step back. There you go. Right. Well, I still need to do the fortitude save for... No, nope, never mind. Nope. Never nope. mind. You interrupted my spell. Yep. 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 All I right, just well, got I just got the slot back. It's his it's the, the worm's turn, and he's uh gonna follow this this once cluster of a couple of people to its recollection or its uh understanding, and is going to, I guess, take an attack of opportunity from Nani. Yeah, I'll I'll go for, I'll hit it. I I'm I'm going to just do regular math because roll 20 is taking so long. So here we go. All right. That's probably going to miss with a 15. Yeah, it misses. All right. Uh, Worm goes for another bite attack on Coggins. So, no, yeah. I don't want you to. <laughs> well, I got a natural one, so it oh, doesn't succeed. Nice. nice. I've gotten so attached now... to Coggins already. <laughs> it is now Nani's turn. What are you going to do, man? All right, so I think Nani is going to. How bad are you hurt there? Are you into your HP? No. Okay. All right, then just going to, uh, as a move action, switch the or activate her gear array. The cloud stays in space, I believe. That's how that works. But I think I have to use a surge to keep that up let me just make sure i like to think your surges are just like the the canned beverage surges and you're just smashing <laughs> a, a whole like tall boy a surge just, every time just throwing a pint back and then just crushing the can and then you're <laughs> right through the thing no that's uh <laughs> that's actually not right so i can only have one array up at a time so i'm going to leave the cloud array up uh, but I'm going to use a move action. 
but you're still adjacent to it. I'm going to move up. Okay. And then I'm going to swing. This is going to move up. 16. That's also a miss. Damn. Got to do better. Roll better, man. Uh, uh, all right. Well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I actually get to tell you that for once. Uh, Coggins, what do you got, man? Okay. So I'm going to take a guarded step to the north as my movement action. And as my standard action, I have gotten that same spell slot back twice now. I'm going to use Death's Door again. Eventually, I'm gonna get you <laughs> with the death storm. Mm. Right, so is that a what DC 19 fortitude, fortitude save? Fortitude save, yes, sir. All right, let me get it for you. Ah, uh, that's a 17. So you actually landed it. Yes. Nice. So it's 4d10 and four strength damage and two dexterity damage. And I'm going to use my last. Um, paradox, which I saved the 10. I didn't say it, but I used the 13 last time. Mm -hmm. I saved the 10. I'm going to guarantee one of my four damage die that are 4d10 is a 10. That's so uh, cool. So that's, I'm going to roll, okay, that's... I'm going to roll 3d10 and then the other one is a 10. Okay. All huh. right. Come on. Big damage. Okay. Uh, 22. 12. So that'll be 22 total, but mm -hmm. you get four strength damage and two dex damage. Good lord. That means your ACD goes down by one and your attacks go down by two, both attacks and damage. Okay. And I am out of paradoxes. That was pretty dope. It's cool, man. I love the, like, because you can use that on, like, gunshots and stuff, too. Like, if you have a weapon that does 1d10 piercing or whatever, you can just paradox it in and guarantee the 10. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty neat. Um, so uh, at that feeling weekend, I think the worm, even though it doesn't have a burrow ability, is going to burrow underground and he's gonna run away. away. Yeah, he's gonna run away. He's, he's gonna take gone. an attack of opportunity. Get it? <laughs> yeah, get that attack. <laughs> I'm gonna hit him as he goes into the ground. It's gonna crawl back into the hole from which it sprung. All right. 18 that's uh with the lower be, you have a minus one to your ac because if of... it was a minus two it would hit but it's not so whatever he's got a got a 20 kac so yeah well we'll see you worm we'll see you <laughs> yeah and don't come back yeah well i that was that was pretty fun i mean like you know obviously we could play test these much much harder but like for time and everything and, and we got to see a little bit of what they could do yeah i mean, I mean I'm, I'm really excited i didn't expect to like the precog as much as i did well it's op as fuck so yeah, yeah. well i mean I, no but i would still really like it if it was wisdom you know yeah like the flavor of it is very cool and i love how tricky it is yeah it's very Nana's reaction and like like after an attack is declared but before the die is rolled you know yeah, I, I really do like that mechanic. I think the nanosite's cool too, because as I said, the versatility. I, 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 it's one of those classes for me where I would need to like grow with it to fully, yeah, to really wrap get my head around the tactics of it, you know. Right. But that was that was pretty fun. And hey, Josh, you did a pretty good job with the worm. Man, thank you. I uh, I tried. Thank you for for running us through it. And I mean. I I do feel like with the precog, with that death store ability is so good and interesting and it you can bounce your spells back to you like a blue deck in magic. Yeah. That like I feel like it's much more versatile, but versatile, but it feels like a 5e warlock, like you're gonna use that same spell at a least 50% of the time. You yeah. Know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I just, that's I fine. Like it's an idea. awesome spell. Can you imagine if I succeeded? at all four of those death stores oh dude yeah, yeah he'd have been those crippled little shriveled worm right. laying yeah. in the sand uh, okay. i just like the idea of not you know it, it not expending a spell slot i mean granted you have to use a, a thing to be able to do yeah. that well i did run really. out of paradoxes and i feel like normally in a fight i would try to be a little more cautious with my sure. paradoxes but i just wanted to show off some of the abilities but I, yeah, I mean, that's a thing you have to balance is like you get them at the beginning of every day, right? Mm -hmm. I will say one thing about that is that I feel like if you use a paradox to bounce back, 
that it shouldn't do any damage. That is like, you know, like no, if you get it, but that's the paradox, damage. Adam. I know, but if I was to if I was to offer like feedback to the play test, that is something that I would offer because I feel like if you get the spell slot back, what you're doing is uncasting it basically because you failed. And so I don't think any damage should go through. I think I that's disagree. a little bit more bad. I disagree because that makes it a full save or suck spell. And the the like one of the great things about the versatility of the class is you have that powerful of a not save or suck spell. Um, and and getting spells back is like a, a bit granted that's what i focused on with this build was i did mm -hmm. everything i could to get spells back but like that's my whole build like mm -hmm. that's not the only build there are way other ways you can play the class but like yeah if i'm specced into getting spell slots back i don't think it's unreasonable at all to get half damage because hmm. you're not getting any of the decks or strength damage and those yeah. are the real killers but i mean half mm -hmm. a 4d10 for no spell slot is still pretty good just gonna throw that out there but, but. you're very limited on how many times you can do that you that's know? true that is true well, i just got lucky and, built and the same spell back twice we're dumping every all of our best stuff on this one monster because we're exactly. not do, doing an adventure day so you know there's a little bit to take into consideration there i listen do you, i hope you guys liked the little theater showcase here I, that's a fun thing we can do with tom talks a lot yeah. you know we could right. do that yeah. before you yeah know? we we definitely want to to do more stuff like this in the future you know have some sort of combat experiments and stuff like that so uh for now guys i think it's intermission time intermission so we're gonna take what what a 10 minute intermission i think it's 12 minutes right 12, 12 minutes 12 specifically minutes. yeah okay we're gonna take an arbitrary number of minutes it's, it's a not arbitrary of music. because that's how the music lined up. Yeah, yeah I know, I know. Music. Uh, but yeah, so everybody take a break. Get yourself a drink. If you enjoyed the uh, combat or have questions, let us know. We'll check them out when we get back. But we've got a whole nother section for you in 12 minutes. We're going to do some lore. We're going to do some listener questions and some other stuff. Trivia. And Trivia. Well, I wasn't saying that because I wanted it to be I a know. surprise. I know. I'm letting you guys in. See you in a you few. You ruined it, Adam. <laughs> All right.
Welcome back. All right. I hope everybody enjoyed the first half of our first Tom Talks Alive. I'm feeling alive myself. Um, got over the, the pre-show jitters I had. Now I'm just pumped. Nice. Uh, nice. <clears throat> so let's talk about something that I'm pumped about. And that is going planet side to Verses, particularly to the city of Kuvakara. Kuvakara. So, uh, since the Epic Tracer crew are headed to Kuvakara, we thought this fascinating location was perfect to do a uh, dig into some additional lore. So, before we go into Kuvakara, though, let's start with Verses, um, in case anybody doesn't really know anything about Verses. Mm. Uh, Verses is technically the fourth planet uh, from the Galarian system, so and fifth if you count Absalom Station, and considering it used to be the planet Galarian, I'd count it. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Verses is tidally locked. So the planet split into two halves. Fulbright perpetually faces the sun and is a desert wasteland, mostly uninhabited except for some like Mad Max style gangs and outlaws. Cool. <laughs> uh, which is something I want to write a one shot for. Yeah. Let's just uh, uh, let's just take the Epic Tracer crew there. Uh, let's do it. Yeah. You know, I'm cool with it. So on the other hand, dark side never receives any sunlight and is trapped in a perpetually frozen nighttime. However, there's a narrow band between Fulbright and dark side along the planet's terminator line that strikes a balance and supports intelligent life and thus society and civilization. And it's along this terminator line that the vast majority of the population of Verses resides within what is known as the ring of nations. Uh, there are no seasons on Verses. There's no day and night cycle. Um, most of the Ring of Nations exists in either a constant twilight or a constant sunrise, uh, which is oddly beautiful, you know, if you could get past the like messing up your sleep schedule kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> but the city of Sky Dock is the most. What's up? Uh, as I say, don't we uh, don't we have some some pictures we, we do but we're not at kuvakar yet we're just talking oh, okay about okay <laughs> we forgot to get versus pictures <laughs> yeah well we're we're learning <laughs> uh so this the city of sky dock is the is versus largest city and economic powerhouse and it's the you know the most talked about location on versus but today we'll be talking about kuvakara in the nation of vimal cue the kuvakara pick uh <laughs> you know i'm on it <laughs> Kuvakara is Versi's second largest city, uh, whereas Sky Dock is the planet's foremost center of trade. Kuvakara's spaceport is a close second. Uh, Kuvakara also houses the seat of the Grand Assembly, which is Versi's primary governing body. Uh, it's, it's kind of their house of representatives. Mm -hmm. um, as a socialist society with elected representatives, residents do have a say in government policy, and the city is generally pretty peaceful. Most crime takes the form of corrupt business practice due to Kuvakara's abundance of corporations operating within Kuvakara's massive industrial complex. Yeah, there's one in particular y'all might have heard of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was, uh, Eclipse? Eclipse. Eclipse. Uh, the, right. the sun, sun bright innovations, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, the Grimdark Corporation. Mm. Yeah. So just some basic stats on, on Kuvakara. It has a population of 30 million. So this is a very large metropolitan city. 55% uh, of that is Rathani, 15% is Sheeran, which is, has a fun historical reason. 10% uh, is human, 5% Kasatha, another 5% Yasoki, 1% Rhyphorian, and 9% everybody else. Notice that there's not Patra as <clears throat> yeah. one of the main. That's part of the <laughs> everybody else, right? Right, right, right. Um, it, its government is a council, a coalition appointed, appointed by the Grand Assembly, um, and it has a list of qualities, and this is one feature I really like in uh, that Starfinder does, partic particularly in the Pact Worlds, is they give you like descriptors of the planet, just qualities that they have. Uh, so the qualities for Kuvakara are cultured, economically disparate, technologically advanced, are the hmm. three that we're given. 
Um, and they even have a side note for the economically disparate. The citizens of the settlement are unofficially but firmly organized into economic classes. And the difference in income between the highest and lowest classes is quite dramatic. Yeah, I mean, like, you'll see in some episodes coming up. And so there's like, a, it's like visually represented even like yeah. this level of stratification. It's like very visually apparent you know the way that the the people of kuvakara are divided right so kuvakara is it has a nickname it is it's called the dusk jewel because it happens to exist on the the fulbright side of the terminator line so instead of it always uh looking like it's about to get dark it always looks like it's a, a there's a perpetual sunrise you know mm -hmm. and it's a supposedly quite nice like that's it, the picture we have ironically is very cloudy and looks dark but it says the only time that you really get very much darkness on verses is when there's a storm coming in mm -hmm. um but yeah so so one of the big features of of verses in general and in particular kuvakara is the extreme income inequality right mm -hmm. bernie sanders would hate this city yeah He'd probably be very successful there, though. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it was originally founded on the Rudoan River. So it was like a trade settlement, as many trade settlements are founded on a river. The river is how you move goods or whatever. But eventually, that became obsolete. But because they were already at a high population at the time, it, you know, the, the city maintained itself and continued to grow into a spacefaring port type city. Um, and even before the gap, Kuvakara was an urban powerhouse with gridded streets, diverse neighborhoods, and a system of bullet trains providing tr public transportation. And they're very pr proud of their bullet trains from what I can gather, because they've had them for so long. <clears throat> um, I mean, they connect most of the city, so. Right. Uh, I mean, back to, we, we mentioned, um, Night City earlier and like Kuvakara just feels so much like Night City from Cyberpunk. Like it, so many of the elements are there. The fact that Verses is a, oh my goodness, sorry for my dog barking. <clears throat> um, the, it, it, ugh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she is so mad at me. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so like Verses in general is a very like tech, based society right and and augmentation is kind of a status symbol on verses and in particular in kuvakara so because of the extreme uh income inequality there are lots of people who aren't afforded the luxury of getting augmentations and they are like de facto members of the pure ones faction not because they don't want um augmentations but simply because they can't afford them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, like it, it's such an interesting city uh, and there's so much room to like explore in this city, you know, like, I mean, I couldn't resist adding to it and I don't see how anybody, you know, as far as what's in the book and what you explore here, that all this is in the back of, of book two of Signal Screams. And there's this just huge, nice, beautiful write-up of this city. And there's just so much great inspiration to just expand on the world of Starfinder and having this cyberpunk themed city, like everything about it is cyberpunk. I mean, it's cybercrime is one of the top th things, right? You know, and that's in like augmentations and cybernetics. And it, it's just everything you want out of a, uh, that kind of deal you know what yeah, you well what's what's interesting uh, to your point is that despite being such a metropolitan city and having so much income inequality that the vast majority of crime is you know cyber crime or or corrupt business practices it's actually a fairly peaceful city and it even talks about how uh, often traffic is jammed up because of peaceful protests throughout mm -hmm. kubakara Let's uh let's let Josh 
get a little voice in here. Maybe Heath, you can go talk to Thug Rose and tell her that everything's going to be all right. <laughs> and and uh, we'll let Josh, well, I, this is what you came for, right? This is what we've been talking about for mm -hmm. a year and a half. You know, how, how excited are you to be in Night City cyberpunk town? You know, well, I, I mirror Heath's sentiment about actually being planet side for once. That's huge. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that it's also a cyberpunk-esque city is really cool. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what type of augmentations Fell can get if he can afford them there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and mostly just, uh, you know, a different, you know, kind of a, a change of pace for the, for the show, for the story. You know, what this place potentially holds because of what it is, mm -hmm. you know, and how the city is. Right. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a lot that can be explored and, you know, particularly fell being from it. There's a lot of mm -hmm. things that we could pull there if, if you wanted to, you know? Yeah. Well, and on top of that, like this is a city like this is why I wanted to play a sci-fi role-playing game or science fantasy role-playing game more than continuing with strictly fantasy, because this type of city is just, it's like what we have now plus a lot. So it's a lot easier for me to relate to, you know, yeah, versus, yeah. versus a, you know, some castle city that has different districts and whatever. It's a lot, a lot more difficult for me to wrap my head around that type of stuff versus, you know, here's this major metropolitan that's built up and is like every block is times square type, you know, crazy lights and, you know, just, uh, I'm looking forward to exploring it. Excellent. Well, I, I am too. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff in it. So uh, like I, I will say coming up like very soon, episode 99, we get a really good look at Kubakara. So I'm excited to share that with all of you because it's, it's some fun times. Like we get to, we get to chill a little bit and, and explore some space and it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Oh, Kubikara is a really <clears throat> just awesome city, man. I'm so excited. Uh, I'm just excited to be planet side, but Kubikara is like a, a jewel on top of that excitement. Right, right. It's like, oh, we get to be on a planet and it gets to be Versys and we get to go to like one of the main cyberpunk themed places on Versys. It's just, it's, it's really good alignment of things. Yeah. Well, and it, yeah. And it's also just neat that cyberpunk dropped when it did. Right. Like the right. video game cyberpunk dropped when it did. It's almost, they delayed it just for, for our for show. Us. They, and they, they had, released it early, even though it wasn't done just for us. Yeah. Yeah. You can blame Southern town foolery for all the problems you have with cyberpunk. <laughs> all the, all the glitches that they haven't fixed yet. That's because we they, talked to them about releasing it. Everybody, now. you're welcome. You're yeah. getting to play it. They, they were in our pocket, you know? Right, right. Uh, you want to get into some trivia, dude? Yeah, yeah. so uh, how, how is this trivia going to work, Adam? All right, so here's the deal, guys. All of you in the chat, this is the trivia is for those of you that come and check us out every month with the Tom Talks Live, and it's going to be a rolling point system. So... We're going to ask a question and the first three people to get the answer right will each get a point. And then we're going to tally that over, I'm sorry, the first two people, not first three people, the first two people. So got to be quick on the jump, you know, if, and if it's obvious that it's like, you're just copying the other person, whatever, we'll, we'll get a little time for everybody to get their answers in two people get it right. You get a point. We're going to do three months worth. And then the people that have the most points over the three months will get, will win a giveaway. There's going to be an easy, a medium and a difficult question each time. All right. So here's, we're going to ask the question. We'll give 30 seconds for everybody to put in the, their answers. Speed is a thing here, so I don't know what to tell you about that. Get good on the typing. I don't want to hear it. Don't at me. This is how we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the first two people that get it right, we'll give everybody, you know, 10 seconds to get their answers in. 
and then we'll reveal the answer and award the points. Uh, Josh, do you want to, as the producer, track the points for us? Uh, yeah, I was, uh, I've already got it pulled up to where I can do that. All right, great. Uh, you want me to ask the first question, Heath? You can if you one? want to. Okay, this is the easy one, because I think you should ask the medium one. I sure. mean, I was going to ask them all, but oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. No, <laughs> it's your show. Okay. All right. So question A, the easy question. What was the name of the club Mike and Zeno used to frequent? All right, you got 10 seconds, folks. Here we go. Boom. We got okay, one. We got one. <laughs> got two. <laughs> Three. Three. All right. I, I mean, I guess I'm gonna yeah, call it there. Yeah, that's 10 seconds. Uh we have we have our two answers. Yep. Well, we have three answers. Uh New Sheo and Phrasma Saves in with the correct answer with the click clack club. Although Phrasma Saves, you're pushing it with click clavic and no <laughs> the click, club the click clavicle club um <laughs> i mean so, you did say that that time is of the essence so you know yeah yeah uh, that's what i'm saying you get the points so new she new Shea and phrasma saves each gets one point for the easy questions put it on the board uh old scratch we're just gonna give you honorable mention here because it's funny tom's diner was his <laughs> answer uh there all right let's go to the medium question heath all right, question number two. Yeah, I mean, we got, hold on, before you say it, look, folks, we got 18 of y'all in the chat right now. Everybody needs to jump on this, man. We're going to give away some cool shit. Get with it. <laughs> Here we go. Question All right. B. <clears throat> question B. What is Titanium Mike's middle name? The tension mm. is killing yeah, me. Yeah, we're not, we're not necessarily looking for exact spelling. But we're just uh yeah, yeah, we got a couple, we got a couple in. We got a couple in. <laughs> All right, we're closing in here. All right, about to call it. All right, that is gonna call it on the 10 seconds here. Uh <clears throat> Nusheo with the correct answer, Rupert is Titanium Mike's middle name. That's correct. Uh, After the cutoff, uh, Old Scratch Johnson, the strongest goddamn vest anyone has ever seen. I like. <laughs> I like. I'd, al I'd almost accept it. I like that Al the Street and Ten Lawn Gnomes both thought that we were doing a trick question here with uh, Al the Street going with Mike and Ten Lawn Lawn Gnomes going with Titanium. Old Scratch Johnson is just going for the funnies. Maybe there'll be a runner-up award for the funnies because uh, so far so good. <laughs> One more question for tonight's Tom Talks. All right. This one's hard. The, this this one. is the difficult one. This question, one's tricky. Question three. What are the names given by the cast to the three Dralicks the crew fought at Outpost Zed <coughs> when they first arrived? Let's give that to him one more time. <clears throat> what are the names given by the cast to the three Dralicks the crew fought at Outpost Zed when they first arrived? Ooh, this one's tough. Yeah, I'll give you guys tough. 15 seconds on this one. Even as a player, I mean, give, him, give him 30. Like, even as a player, I don't remember this. Like, yeah, I guarantee you. I remember you one of it. them. But <laughs> me being me. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll give you extra time here. <laughs> oh, man, this one's tough. This one is tough. Yeah, so yeah, far, we've is, got uh, the asparagus question. heads, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Dr. Dre is one of them. Uh, Orin Vance says, I've nailed all of these. Just saying. Well, yeah, you're in the show, Zach. We know. <laughs> We're not going to commit insider trading, all right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, man, we. Uh, I will say we do not have a right answer yet. I'm going to give it another 10 seconds, and then we're going to call it. And we're trying to account here for the lag, too. So that's, mm -hmm. if you hear some extra silence, that's what we're doing here. Man, I'm not seeing anything else pop up. I, so. I think we stumped them on this one, y'all. <laughs> Look, yeah. there's going to be hard ones. I guess we'll we, say, could, I, we, we could have given them a hint on that one. 
that well, we, it's a, okay, we, ca- we, we, what, we called them the three dr- we, well we called them the three drays they're three right? drays because they're all we'll give the hint three drays i'll give another what another 15 seconds with that hint yeah, give it a, give it a minute and if if we uh <laughs> a minute we're not going to sit here in silence for a minute seconds. so we don't have to sit here in silence we can, we can talk about stuff. how you doing josh i'm great man I'm great <laughs> Just makes myself a uh, vodka cranberry pineapple, so yeah. that's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a little bit of a cranberry painkiller. Okay. I don't, think, I don't think we're gonna get anything on this one. I don't think. I, I think we stumped them. <laughs> Dr. Dre, Andre, three thousand, and oh, from old man. scratch. Drake, oh, Dr. Man. Dre, something else. Oh, Drake. No. Like we're so close. Dre, no. <laughs> uh, all right. So I'm gonna cut it. Nobody got it though. There was a combined. So let's give half a point each to New Sheo and Old Scratch because the two of them combined got it. So they each get a half a point here for the hard one. It is Dr. Dre, Andre 3000, and Drake. That was the name of the a Space Asparagus. Do you remember which one you bit the, you, you ate a piece of their head? Probably Drake because I hate Drake. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Okay, well, now you know that the level of trivia we're asking. Easy, medium, hard. Every three months, we'll total up scores and give something stupid away. So thank y'all. And let's next section. That's it on the trivia. Well, we're, we're down to the last shot, man. And this is the probably the one I'm the most excited about is our first time ever getting to do live and in-person listener questions. Indeed. Yeah. So hit us with them questions and we will do our best, which is admittedly not always very good. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask one uh, that Nusheo had. uh, And again, everybody in chat, hit us with some more. So we've got some more to roll with. But uh, Nusheo asks, do the God Vessel Verthani cast have a foothold in Kuvakara? I have no idea, but considering Kuvakar is a city of 30 million people, I would say probably. Yeah, if I had to guess, I'd say yes. I mean, they are one of the major casts, so, you know, they, I can't, I mean, there's there's a church everywhere, you know, and with them being the God vessels, they're probably trying to spread their word in the places that would be detestable to them. Mm. So, you know, kind of a, a mission type thing, if you will. Yeah. Good question. Uh, question from uh, for Asthma Saves. Uh, that is Steve from Hideous Laughter, if I am not mistaken. That's correct. He plays Mutume and Samunile on that show. Mm-hmm. Uh, he asks, what Starfinder class would you most like to be in real life? Ooh, that's a good question. <clears throat> I, we have not been asked that before. Um. Okay. Well, I think for me, I, if I could be in a class, I think I'd like to be a mystic. That's uh, just cause like, I don't know, it's close to Druid and like, that's the kind of magic I'm into. And, um, it's not really the class that I have a lot of interest in playing in Starfinder, which is weird. Uh, but like, it's one that I want to do the things that you could do in real life. So that's that's my answer. Well, I think Mystic is a really good catch-all answer because Mystics inherently are just so versatile. Like mm-hmm. you could be a Druid, you could be a Paladin. You know, there's so many different kinds of Mystics that you could be <clears throat> that I'm tempted to go with that one as well. Uh, especially if the answer is just like which class and not like what specific spec of right. the class, right? So, because like... <clears throat> I mean, I'd love to say soldier, but in reality, I'm way too lazy for that. Like, I don't, I don't want to actually be a soldier. <laughs> right. Um, I think <sighs> witch warper would be pretty wild. Like having insight into other, like, like knowing for a fact that there's a multiverse and having access to other existences yeah. and other realities would be trippy. Yeah, that might be brain breaking. Yeah, it might be too much. Again, I'm pretty lazy, so like that's a that's a lot of mental work you're doing there. But uh, pure fun, yeah, probably witch warper because it could get wild, and I could still be like a summoner. Hmm. 
I mean, if I had to say class wise, what I would want to be, I'm not actually going to say mechanic because that's what I do real world. And yeah, you, know, you already are. That's I already am. Um, I would, I'd probably say, man, that's tough. Uh, it'd be something to do with magic. It'd have to be a magic based class, like something outside of, of the, the normal real whatever like like a technomancer or something would be really cool. yeah i was right? gonna say technomancer for you yeah because it's still got like the mechanical interest in tech you know mm-hmm. and, and it's like magic through technology in a sense right. or combined right. two or combining the two um so cool. yeah all right that's a good question i can't believe we haven't answered that before uh what about I don't know if we can ask this one because it's uh, kind of spoilery. The least comfortable part for you regarding the surgery episodes. I don't know. Oh, yeah, let's let's answer that. I will say at this point, if you're not caught up through episode 97, thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight. But we're going to enter spoiler territory. This is the beauty of interacting with live listeners, and you know, or or do we want to save that as the last question so that people who are not caught up can hang well, out. And... Listen, you're the producer. You're supposed to We're decide gonna do that, that before you flip We're gonna do questions. That. We're going to do that. <laughs> so so uh, keep that in mind. Uh, okay. All right. We'll keep it in mind. We're yeah. going to go with one uh, from 10 Lawn Gnomes. Uh, if you had to remove one sci-fi or sci-fi influence from the world, like real world, what would you erase? Well, why would, why would Wait, I do what? that? I wouldn't. If you had to remove one sci-fi influence from the world. I'd say maybe. Let's see, I don't know what all it influenced and what what it would. Are you asking from like the world of Starfinder or are you asking from the world of like our world? You know, that's, let's get some clarification on that. I mean, real world, I don't know that I would want to remove anything because Mm -hmm. then Starfinder might not exist. You yeah, that, I mean, who knows what individual book or movie might have been the the thing that pushed Starfinder into existence. I mean, yeah. like if Logan's Run hadn't existed, maybe this uh, would never happen. <laughs> Old Scratch Johnson says, "Ready Player One." <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I listen. I I can't argue that. Uh, yeah, the book's all right. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I don't know. I mean. I wouldn't remove any sci-fi influence from the from our world you know because i think all all stories have value to learn or learn what not from you know yeah Um, like i don't and he follows it up like would you drop like would you drop star wars aliens starcraft some overly cliche anime assume starfinder the game is unchanged like i don't see i don't see any specific sci-fi series or book or anything really being so detrimental that it shouldn't be there yeah i don't have like hate for anything like that you know or i mean it's not even hate but yeah like you said detrimental i maybe the dune sequels so dune's legacy would be just dune you know and it would be like Ooh, you better be glad john left already (laughs) (laughs) bro you're, you're gonna catch some hate mail well, that's uh, here we go. Now we got do, to something do, spicy. Do you, wait, so do you mean the everything after the original Dune, or do you mean the ones his son helped write? I believe probably the one I haven't read the ones the son has written, but those are prequels, and from what I understand, those are actually pretty good. It's it's Dune. Uh, the, I will say, based on what I've read of the Dune series written by Frank Herbert, is the first Dune book is good and should stand alone as its own book. And if it did, I think its legacy would be way stronger. Person. Mm. Have you read those books? Yeah. I have. Well, I've read the second one okay. and, and I was like, no, I'm good. I'll yeah. I mean, I, I can't make that argument, but I will say I love Dune and I've read it twice and I tried to read the second one and I did not finish it. That Same. said, I don't know that I'd erase anything, man. Like, I, I just, I'm not super about the premise of the question because I think the 
genres are tapestries, you know, that right. like even something you, you might not like helped influence something else. And the same with Starfinder. Like if, it, if we're talking about Starfinder, well, I don't want to remove something that I, I may hate the story of something, but there's a cool tech element or something like that that influenced something very cool. Right. So I don't know. That's a very tough question for me to, to pop my, my hate button off on, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, so, so to move along, if you had to pick one intellectual property that would be your epitome of a setting for a tabletop role-playing game or one that you would see above all others, what would you pick and why? If you want it, basically, if you, is there a certain fandom or setting that you wish that there was a tabletop role-playing game to be able to play through and why? Hmm. I mean, like a lot of them already have it, right? Like there's a Star Wars TTRPG and right. there's like there's, an there's, Star, there's like Star Wars I mean, Expanse board started games from and a stuff. tabletop game. Yeah, but right. now it has like its own its own game. Like official I mean, one, yeah. Cy- yeah. Cyberpunk was a TTRPG, you know. I, what I would like personally, and this is just because I love the the universe, and I understand that it is already a uh, strategy type game, a competitive strategy game in in a similar vein to uh say uh, the Warhammer games is a, an actual battle tech tabletop role playing game, not just the combat stuff, but all of the, everything else in between all the lore and everything. Yeah. And it may be there and I'm not aware of it, but if it isn't, that needs to happen because I love that setting so much. I grew up with the mech warrior games, grew up reading the battle tech books and would love to, you know, be a part of that universe for a it's- while. It's weird for me, like, I don't want my TTRPGs to be limited to an IP. You know, like, I like that Starfinder or Pathfinder or Dungeons and Dragons can be kind of whatever you want it to be, you know, within those genres. Like, the thing about the Star Wars RPG is that, like, everything is Star Wars, which is cool, I guess, you know, but, like, it's much more limited to like having to know the star Wars lore in the star Wars world. And you're playing in star Wars, as opposed to having something that's like, here's a system that you can use to tell whatever story you want to tell, you know, but that's just my preference. I mean, big, big mood said Hellboy, And that would be a that very would be cool. fun, like the that classes cool. and stuff you could get from Hellboy mm-hmm. would be amazing. Uh, I wonder, is there anything like that for like, cowboy bebop like i know oh, that's like cool a too. beloved sci-fi anime but i've never heard if there's like a, a yeah there's a little, a TTRPG. little ttrpg called starfinder yeah, i feel like that's do. something you could adapt <laughs> to another system like starfinder to easily right. and yeah but but again that's like a yeah, I, so i remember in well, high school it's a like no magic universe well, that's right? what it's i was getting tech, to like i universe. remember in high school playing a modification to D 3.5 called d20 modern mm-hmm. so right. based on the on the you know 3.5 uh rule set but all of it was real world stuff no magic no you know it was a a conversion for it so that'd be a cool thing potentially to see with the starfinder rule set uh similar to something along the lines of like grimmer space you know yeah yeah i mean essentially my, my problem with the, this question is that like i as as many different ips as i love in sci-fi they all elements of all of them work to be the whole of what Starfinder is. So I'd just take Starfinder, you mm-hmm. know, like if my option is Starfinder or a different TTRPG based on a specific IP, I'll take Starfinder every single time. Cause you can integrate the parts of that IP that you like. Right. Which mm-hmm. and I'm not hating on, on the IP thing. Like if you're a diehard Star Wars fan and have been for years, well, then that's going to be perfect for you. If you already know all this lore, you're going to get so much out of the Star Wars TTRPG. Mm-hmm. But like, if you don't, if you're more a generalist, like most of our, most of us are, that that's just a harder line in the sand as far as like lore you have to learn. Right. right. And, and right. not wanting to get something wrong. Right. You know? Right. Right. Okay. What All you right. got next for us? Oh, let's see. Next question. Uh, I believe this is actually going... Actually, no. One more based off of the topic of today's episode. Uh, this is going to be posed first to Heath and then to Adam. Okay. Uh, okay. 
Heath, based on your little time, your little Who's bit asking? of time, I'm sorry, Old Scratch Johnson asks. Okay. Okay. Uh, Heath, based on your little bit of time with the precog, give one thing that you would change and one thing that you would keep. Oh, well, that's super easy. I'd change it to a wisdom caster because fuck decks. And uh, I, I would definitely keep the paradox system. The paradox system is awesome and tricky and really, it's, it's the kind of thing that when you get it right, like it makes you look like a genius, you know? Gotcha. It's a very rewarding system to be part of that class. So yeah, easily change, change to wisdom, keep paradoxes the way they are. Okay. Adam, same question, but for nanosite. Uh, okay. So for me with the nanosite, I feel like the gear array as it's written right now is overly complicated and like to do a kind of simple thing, like your gear array basically gives you access to make like a couple weapons and then a bunch of minor items, but like it's four paragraphs associated with like, uh, uh, an economy count of like what, you know, you have to invest materials into your nanobite bank to then be able to make, you have your, your arm shift into a rifle or something like that. You know, like it's the con conceptually it's cool, but, as it's written, it just seems so. Um, I, f I found myself reading through that like three or four times, and maybe this is just me as a player and how my brain works, but just being like, oh, like this isn't fun to wrap my head around, you know? Like, I have to keep up with a whole different economy. Like, e every time we go through a dungeon, I'm going to be making sure I loot every random piece of gear because I need to invest that, you know? Like, it makes it turns you into a loot goblin. Well, yeah. And like, you have to really pay attention and manifest the economy of that or manage the economy of that, you know? And it's like, that's not what I particularly like out of the game. I know some people do, but for me, like, that's not a resource that I want to keep up with. You know, I like I the can, idea of I being can... able to shift into a sword in my hand, but I don't want to know if I've invested in enough UPBs based right. on like three random automatic rifles that i broke down you know dude i could see john playing a, a, a like hardcore dedicated nano site and like taking 45 minutes to do one turn mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and so like but i will say on the other side of that i love the flavor of that i love the flavor of being able to just like turn into a weapon that you need you know and i and i i, I you know, I'm not a game designer, so I don't know what the better option is there, but I do love that flavor. And what I really like about the nano site is its versatility. So like, I wouldn't want to let go of that at the expense of the versatility of the class, because it's a very cool concept. I love that it's a constitution based class and it feels like one and all the different arrays and, and knacks that you can get can really kind of make you do a lot of cool things. So I love the flavor of it. I love the versatility, keep it. I wish that the gear array portion was a little bit more concise or, or less required to track so much to use, you know? Cool. Well, uh, uh, well, hold up. Gr Griffin like counter asked about the question with intellectual property games he says what if the mechanics are better in an ip focused game and i'd say if i heard about how awesome the mechanics of one of these was i'd give it a shot that'd be awesome yeah. i'd have a good time playing it even though i probably wouldn't know a lot of the lore uh, i definitely wouldn't discriminate because it's an ip yeah yeah so i actually asked uh i don't even i probably messed up and didn't even say who asked the ip question uh it was chris cade who's a very close friend of mine. And okay. I actually sent him a message afterwards, or sorry, he sent me a message saying, you know, I think that, that we misunderstood what we meant by IP. So I asked for clarification. And he said he meant an IP like Starfinder, Pathfinder, D&D, Shadowrun, Cyberpunk, whatever, like a, an existing tabletop role-playing game. Which one would be the epitome of what, like for, for our oh, Starfinder. Flavor? And well, right. for us, it's Starfinder, but mm -hmm. like, that's such a, a, a to the table question, you know, like for, for us, Starfinder does everything that we want out of the game. It gives us magic. It gives us tech. It gives us a whole 
universe to explore. It gives us spaceships. It gives us any kind of story we want to tell. So that's why it works for us. You know, we love Starfinder. Um, but I don't, I would not say that Starfinder is the only, or, not, or is the, like the top system that everybody should play. Yeah, it's like not I the want everybody to, play, yeah, I want everybody to play it because I think it's great and I love it. But like, if you don't like science fiction, it's not going to be your game, <laughs> you know, like. Right. And that, and that's fairly common. Like there's lots of people like, I just really like fantasy and it's like, well, you should play. Uh, five e or <laughs> pathfinder one e or two e and just yeah. from there figure out what mechanics you like better you know mm -hmm. cool we go well, into uh, the spoilery questions now yeah yeah we're gonna head into the, the the spoilery questions i've got two of them both from old scratch johnson okay uh and they're somewhat related to each other so uh anybody who has not caught up uh earmuffs um i guess we're gonna try to not be super in depth with it, I but would, there are going I would to be say light spoilers. This, I would say at this point, like they're probably going to get into s some specific spoilers because it'll okay. be hard to answer these questions without it. So okay. if you if you're not caught up to ninety seven, thank you so much for joining us <laughs> for our first Tom talks live. But I would highly suggest that you sign off here. You're not going to miss anything else. Mm -hmm. This is this is the end of the episode, and thanks for joining us. Yeah. But yeah, and, and if, for those and of if, you leaving, uh, we'll see you. Yeah. yeah. Well, and those of you leaving just for being here, <laughs> that's for you. All right. So going into spoiler territory. And again, last warning, go ahead and get out. But <laughs> go on, yeah. scratch. <laughs> go on, bitch. Get go on, get. Uh, old Scratch Johnson asks, so what was the least comfortable part for you regarding the surgery episodes? Hmm. For each of us or for Yeah, Adam? for each of us individually. I I think I'm gonna go ahead and answer it is the the brain scooping. Because yeah. the idea of a lobotomy is one of the only things that truly makes me queasy. Like just just the the what it does to a person and the questions that it raises as to what constitutes who you are and how that can change and affect somebody. Um, and I know Fell wasn't directly involved with that, but that coming up was like a, like a ugh, kind of thing for me, you know? Um, and we talked about, you know, triggers or, or, you know, content type stuff in our session zero for this campaign or for this AP. And, you know, that was something I put on the table, but I also was like, you know what, don't hold it back. It's not so uncomfortable that I'm not okay with it being there. It's just like, that's one of the few things that really really like kind of twists my stomach a little bit mm -hmm. well speaking of stomachs <laughs> um <laughs> the like scalpel like chest to navel is uh that's terrifying to me the abdomen should not open <laughs> and neither should the chest you know uh that that bugged me but also like <laughs> Uh, this question again is hard because it's like well what part wasn't uncomfortable <laughs> you know like yeah. all of it was awful uh i will say the like the the brain bit the like removing the top of his head i watched some of the later like not silence of the lambs but like hannibal like way too young i was like a teenager <laughs> and that always stuck with me uh, the the one where he cuts the guy's the top of the guy's head off while he's still alive and like has a conversation. Yeah. 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 Nope. Yeah. Not about uh, it. You know, for me, it, it it wasn't so much like the graphicness of it. I mean, like writing all that, I was like, oh gosh, there. This is, you know, this is a little rough. But it was just. It was putting y'all through it, you know, like if y'all remember at the beginning of the episode before we pressed record, I mean, I recorded that whole episode in the dark, by the way, like when we were on our call, I didn't have any lights on. They couldn't see my face because I couldn't, I couldn't like face them as Adam to do that episode. Like I had to, I had to be in the dark and it just be detached from them because I was putting all of them in a position that I knew that they wouldn't like, you know, like it, 
and I, I trusted and believed still to this point that they trusted me with the story enough that this was something that needed to happen, even as difficult as it was to do. But like actually putting them in the position to be like, all right, uh, you know, for me asking Emily, hey, so is uh, Ziva going to cut Oren's soul? You down with that? Like me having to actually physically ask that was the hardest bit for me, you know? And, and, and I was really stressing going into that episode. Like I wasn't not feeling good at the beginning of it and was just kept telling us like oh guys this is rough this is gonna be rough uh yeah the, to, to back that up like adam was was a mess going into that yeah. like <laughs> like just just like I, at one point and i'm probably misremembering but like i i don't know if this if, if i can do this you know yeah like, like i don't know if i can do this to you guys as friends or as, <laughs> as your friend you know yeah. um I personally felt pretty fortunate in that, like, like I was glad I wasn't an Emily or I, I was glad I play the character I, I play because when the question of what will you do came about, my choice was very obvious. You know, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, well, not about it. And I will be aggressive, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, whatever outcome that causes, that is obviously what the character would do. So I, I felt really fortunate that my character was defined enough in that way that it wasn't as hard a pill to swallow, you know, figuring out what you wanted to do right? Uh, or, or what the uh, best way to move forward was. Yeah. And, and that actually segues perfectly into the next question. Uh, also from old scratch Johnson uh, specifically to Adam. And I guess we could answer it as well. Uh, but did the cast react how you expected them to during those scenes or did something unexpected happen? Um, pretty much. Every, I mean, so Zach couldn't do anything other than what I said he was going to do. So, I mean, he, his agency, that was the first time his agency was really taken away. And that was him getting his manifestation, which he had avoided in new Elysium, you know, but you're going to get a manifestation at some point. So I figured that this would be kind of the most, narratively relevant and impactful way to do it and so he was just kind of so i knew where he was going he didn't have a choice with what I, who i wasn't entirely sure who was going to do what they were going to do was kuiper and fell you know really yeah like kuiper i didn't know if he was gonna like play along just from a logical sense of seeing how it would play out with fell I wasn't sure how much the loner outsider tactic that the scientist took with you was going to play. Um, mm -hmm. I will say I was a little surprised at how little it impacted you, you know, like and how, how much you were like, no, nah, dude, fuck that. Fuck that. <laughs> like, these are my friends and I know they're my friends. You're not going to tell me that they're not. So, you know, that, that was a little bit of a surprise because I thought that that might, kind of needle you a little bit yeah but didn't. i mean you had something going there but you know everything that happened at, at galta and outpost zed and mm -hmm. condes leading up to that like there's so much more he, he felt had gone through so much with that group of people except for kuiper mm -hmm. up until that point or until that point that like that's the, they're his chosen family yeah so yeah. of course he's not going to. And well, I was proud of you for for resisting, you know, and uh, and I think it made for a big moment for Fell, uh, because I knew Mike would, you know, like he just he's not he doesn't understand it enough to even engage in it. He's like, you're hurting my friends, I will kill you, pretty much, yeah. you know. Yeah, uh, which so is I, the simplicity of Mike that I love and appreciate. Right. You know? um, and then with Ziva, you know, I felt like she would make the cut but i promise you that we did not talk about that before oh no she was a mess when yeah. she was and after having made that decision like just like i, th I think i mean I, I don't know like she she was it was it was tough for emily in that mm -hmm. moment it was and the, well deciding really what to do was, and it was it, it was, was tough for emily because of what ziva would do well i 
I think it became more tough for Emily in the aftermath when mm. everybody was talking about it and like she was having to face the decision she met made in the face of her crew and her fellow players you know because like she made the decision and then we ended the episode and we're like oh god that was a crazy episode and like we just need to talk about something else and then we come back a week later to do the rest of the lab scene and then the the fallout where everybody talks about it and that was the moment where i think emily really had a hard time and and got kind of caught up in well, what Ziva would do and are the players actually like, are my friends actually mad at me for doing this as Ziva? You know, like yeah, there was, I, I didn't help with that at all. Well, yeah, because you <laughs> came at her hard as Mike, you know? And so like it, it created this like real legit tension and uncertainty. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and pull Eric's question out of there with 10 lawn gnomes uh, after, after sessions like that, how do you all decompress? Well, we had to decompress in the middle of the follow-up session. So with mm -hmm. 98, where we're dealing with the fallout, like we had to stop and like, be like, okay, guys, these are our characters. We're players. We're all doing what our characters would do, but like nobody's actually mad at anybody. Like it was just tough because we had dug so far into the emotion of it all, you know? And I will say what we did to decompress after that was, play a bunch of sessions for fun you know mm -hmm. that i mean that's that was the follow-up to that is okay that happened we can, we're not going to ignore that that's a thing that's now exists in this group but we're going to put a pin in the in the in the heaviness for a little bit and just play and have a good time and like be friends playing a game with each other you know Cool. Well, that's uh, that's pretty much it for the listener questions this time. Well, uh, thank you guys for the questions. <laughs> yeah. Those are great. I well, mean, that's again, it's just funny. It's like a heavy note to end on, you know. Um, but for real, everybody, thank you. The, this is the first time we've done Tom Talks alive. Alive. And uh, we we had a good time. I, I, you know, I speak for the other guys because I assume I can. But it was a lot of fun getting to do the play test, like. Mm -hmm. on the stream like that's the kind of thing i'm definitely interested in so th thanks for being here guys like it, it means a lot to us we're glad we've gotten to move into a new thing and start learning how to be visually appealing <laughs> <laughs> alive um all right but yeah we're gonna get out of here and we episode 100 y'all coming oh, yeah. up january episode 2nd 100 Let's go. So we'll do another, we'll do a stream, but it'll be way less formal than this, right? And in January 2nd, starting at 5 p.m., do a couple hours before we listen to the episode together. Yeah, and, and it's gonna be awesome. Like what I just cannot wait to celebrate this milestone with all of y'all. So mark it on your calendars, be there. You're not gonna want to miss it, I promise you. January 2nd, 5 p.m. Central yeah all right everybody have a good night we love you all of southern tomfoolery loves you thanks for thanks for being here yep we'll see you we'll see you we'll see you <laughs>